please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, this is just a short update to video 10. I'm going to title this one 10B. It's just an update to the performance testing I was doing yesterday, so I'm going to beg everyone's forgiveness here. Um, <laughs> I, I um, fell victim to 1980s car stereo mentality. Um, I was quoting yesterday actually peak voltage, I mean, uh, uh, peak wattage out of this amplifier and not RMS wattage out of this amplifier. And so you can see here in, in, a, in a post uh, Robert made, um, you know, voltage peak to peak is two times voltage peak, which I had done the, you know, half the peak to peak. Um, but then what I had not done was the uh, 0.707 times that to get RMS. So if you kind of go down that path and follow the math here, you basically end out with power out on triode mode at RMS voltages, uh, which would give you RMS power, um, 7.6 watts out, and in ultralinear, 9.8 watts out before we started having what, what would be a visual... Um, via the oscilloscope here um, distortion. I've also been playing around with the audio discovery analyzer suite which by the way um, if you plan to use it to drive your um, amplifier um, very hard you need to provide a separate um, 5 volt supply to the analog discovery 2. So if you buy an analog discovery 2 they also sell a little power supply on there, a little wall warp um, get one of those to go along with your unit there. So, at any rate, um, I thought I'd show you a couple of the uh, the stats um, um, using the tool, and they they come out pretty darn close to this 7.6 watts and 9.8. Okay, we're going to use a different test here on this, and the reason I hadn't shown it yet was I was struggling to get it to work properly, so thus I was just working off the bench over here. But after adding that uh, power supply to apparently the USB and the length of the cable I have um, as I start driving the uh, analog discovery to without the separate power supply was causing all sorts of glitches. Um, so this is a setting here called THD plus noise versus power. And by the way, the, the measurement that it puts out is in RMS. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to take um, 20 steps per order of magnitude. I'm going to tell it to stop when it gets to 5% distortion. I do have to tell it here that I'm running into an 8 ohm load. I'm going to tell it to sweep from uh, you know 10 milliwatts up to, and let's uh, we can change that up to 100 watts here. It's not going to get there. Um, and it, you can tell it whatever frequency you want to run this test at. So let's run this. And right now we are in ultra linear mode, by the way. Um, and what you'll see here is that, so you're kind of comparing uh, this time how hard you're driving the amplifier at a given frequency versus the percent distortion it provides at that, okay? So you kind of start out over here driving it really low and your, your distortion here, you know, you're at 0.197. As you creep along, you're still at 0.1% distortion. You get up in here, you're driving it with a watt here, and you're getting 0.082% distortion, which is pretty darn good. Uh, I say a volt, one volt. Um, and then you keep climbing up, 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 up. And at some point here, all right, here at 8 watts out, we're at about a 1% distortion in ultralinear mode. And then as you notice here, we get up to about 9 watts out. Um, and we start to get closer to 2% distortion. And my personal opinion, and a lot of amplifiers that were designed back in the 50s or whatever, they would be, you know, they would run at 3, 4, 5% distortion uh, regularly. Um, but in my opinion, anything above about 2 or 3% distortion isn't really, it might not sound bad, but it's really not what I'm chasing. So you're right, here at a 2% distortion, you're at 11 watts out. So that, that kind of coincides there with what we were seeing, 9 or 10 watts out of this thing, and you, the distortion starts to creep up in ultralinear mode. Let's run the same test in triode mode. Okay, I'm leaving all the settings the same, and I'm going to click Run. And it will create us a new chart here in triode mode. Okay. And if you'll notice, similar numbers. We're way down here at 0.19% distortion, 0.93, 0.94, 0.96, 0.97, 0.98, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99,
you know, bounces around a little bit here. And by the way, you can uh, run instead of 20 steps per gradient. Um, you could order, you could run at 50 or 100. It just takes longer. Um, but you can see here, uh -huh, look at this. Right up here around 7, 8 watts is where we start to get up into the above 1% distortion range. And then we get up to 2% as we get closer to, you know, 9 watts here. So pretty spot on with the... Um, you know, with the test we had done over using the oscilloscope, what, what that tells you is you don't need um, this audio analyzer discovery suite unless you want to. Um, you could get by with a uh, signal generator and a uh, oscilloscope and be pretty darn close. Uh, but this this is a pretty darn cheap route too, uh, and we're going to be making more videos on this this suite. So anyway, you can kind of see a little over nine, close to ten watts out on. Um, RMS on the uh, ultralinear mode, and you're probably about here around 8 watts or so is what I would say, um, RMS and triode mode. Okay, just a couple closing thoughts here on this amplifier that have been running around in my head the last few days. Um, I had a guy email me last night named Richard Weber, and he said, hey, Mark, um, just, just a tip here. Basically, if you're going to change the voltage on that 6M1P down to 160 volts, you may need to rebias the tube. And um, he is he is spot on. I actually, you remember when I in the middle of my uh, I think it was video nine or or video eight, um, I had kind of said, hey, I'm going to drop out for a couple days and do some testing with this unit. I had actually played around with the bias. I had I put a resistor substitution box in, and I had kind of. Um, you know, just uh, swapped in and out um, various resistor values for the cathode resistor in the 6M1P. And while I did get the distortion figures a little better, I really know, in other words, got it into uh, a, linear, a more linear mode on the uh, curve characteristics, or tube characteristics, I never really found a spot where it sounded great. Um, and so I keep coming back around to my original statement. I'm wanting to stay true to the original schematic here that we have put together. It, um, you know, it, there's a 20 some page um, forum post on Audio Karma about how they got to this point, um, you know, one tweak after another. And so I'm going to try to stick with that. Now, having said all that, there are a ton of tweaks you could do with this amplifier. You can roll in and out different rectifier tubes, different output tubes, different driver tubes. You could get in there and play around with the cathode resistor in the uh, 6M1P. You could play around with the LEDs in the 6M1P. And that's that's ultimately what I ended up saying back to Richard is, hey, I played around a good bit with the cathode resistor, but I got to the point I felt like um, I was really going to have to start playing with the uh, voltage drops across the, that uh, LED to get to get things maybe in a better place. Um, similarly, you could play around with the 500 ohm uh, cathode resistor in the uh, in the um, output tubes. There's a lot of things you could do. I'm going to try to stick with this ultimately, and um, and then what I thought was down the road, maybe a month or two, if you know I've continued to tweak with this amp and play with it, I'll probably come back around and um, you know make another little video to say, hey, here's an optimum mode, right? And here's some other optimum modes that I've found you might could operate this thing in. A um, couple other things. All right, another question I've been getting quite a bit about this amplifier is what does it take to drive it? And it does take a little more than your standard iPhone or whatnot would put out. Um, not that you couldn't drive it with an iPhone or whatnot, an iPod. Um, you could, and it would sound great. You're just not going to be able to drive it all the way to full power um, out of this amplifier. So I do recommend a preamp. I mean, there's only one gain stage on the front end of this, which is the uh, 6M1P or whatever tube you choose there. Um, so I do recommend a preamp to drive this amplifier with. Uh, you know, a volt and a half or so really gets this thing singing pretty well. Um, at any rate, some of you guys may remember early in 2018, I started breadboarding a, a dual 6SN7 um, SRPP preamp. And it's still on my bench. It's still an active project. I've still been tweaking it. Um, ultimately, I'm going to build, um, just like this series, I'm going to build an entire series on how to build this preamp. 
Um, so stay tuned. It won't be in early 2018. It may be late, um, you know, maybe springtime or summertime. I got a few other projects like the Analog Discovery 2. I want to get the uh, the e-tester, tube tester project out of the way. I got a couple other little things here and there, and then we're going to come back around to building this uh, this preamp. So um, you know, in the meantime, drive it with your iPhone um, or, um, or or pick you up a cheap preamp, and then down the road, hopefully, we'll build this uh, preamp, which would make a great match for this unit. So uh, yeah. Okay, the other question I've been getting, and by the way, I'm just doing a few of these question and answers to kind of make this a 10-minute video. But the other question I've been getting a lot is, what kind of speakers do I need with this setup, Mark? Do I have to have some really efficient speakers? And the answer is kind of, yeah, you, that's, that holds true with just about any single-ended amplifier. I mean, if you, you could build a single-ended 211 or um, 805 or something like that and get out a considerable amount of power. But um, for most single-ended amps, fairly low wattage, you need some efficient speakers. If you've got an old set of JBL L100s laying around and they're 87% efficient, while they will sound good, you're not going to get the most out of your setup. You probably need something 92, 94 dB or higher to really get the most out of this system. In my office here, I'm driving a set of uh, Clips uh, Cornwalls. They've got the Kreitz crossovers and the Kreitz tweeters in them. Sounds phenomenal. I mentioned moving this into my other room uh, here and um, uh, the listening room. And in there, I've got Clips K horns, uh, the Clips horns. So those are pretty, you know, all pretty efficient speakers. KG4s, I took, it, I took it the other day up to my sunroom and I've got a set of uh, Clips KG4s in there. It sounded amazing. Also drove a set of, um, oh, what were they? A uh, set of Roger Studio ones that I have, and it sounded pretty good. And I think those are about 92 dB. Um, so you know, you need something fairly efficient, in, in my opinion. All right, I'm going to call this video a wrap, and I'm going to get busy making the video on um, the walkthrough. Thanks for watching, everybody.